An ancient Bedouin legend claims that God took a handful of the south wind and formed a horse. A horse that would have flight without wings. Hi, I'm Connie Alexander. The ancestors of the horse that the Bedouin tribes held in such high esteem lives today. The oldest purebred horse in the world, the Arabian. There is no simple concrete answer as to the origin of the Arabian horse. There are conflicting theories about the exact location the undomesticated ancestors of this breed first called home. Even so, the Arabian lineage can be traced back thousands of years, making the Arabian the oldest breed of horse in the world. The Arabian horse carried the Egyptians in war and conquest 3,500 years ago. The Roman Empire was able to extend its borders further and further because of the strength and endurance of this hot-blooded horse. Some of history's greatest warriors recognized the incredible energy and intelligence of these horses. Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Alexander the Great, and George Washington all rode Arabians. No one can deny the romance and mystery surrounding this breed. The Bedouin tribes may well be credited with keeping the bloodline of the Arabian pure. They were obsessed with the careful breeding of their prized mares and meticulously recorded bloodlines. These horses were bred to withstand the harsh environment of the desert. They needed strength and stamina for survival. Their primary use among the Bedouins was the same as with other ancient cultures. They were war horses. Desert warfare depended on their speed and agility. These horses were held in such high esteem by the desert peoples that they were often housed right in the same tents where the family slept. The characteristics that made these horses so valuable to the ancient civilizations also appealed to the colonists who were building a new world. The Arabian was first introduced to the Americas by Nathan Harrison in 1725. Their numbers did not begin to increase significantly until they were featured at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. The 45 horses exhibited by Turkey were so well received that breeding programs began to flourish. An Arabian is unmistakable in appearance. The head has a distinctive dish profile. They have large, prominent, wide-set eyes and large nostrils that are set in a small muzzle. The neck is arched and runs into a long shoulder and broad chest. They have a strong back and a high tail carriage. They vary in size from 14-2 to 15-2 hands high. Although Arabians are now being bred for greater size, they usually weigh between 800 and 1,000 pounds. This breed comes in many colors, including gray, chestnut, bay, roan, and black. Selective breeding for intelligence and a gentle nature have created a horse with an affectionate disposition who bonds well with people. These horses can make wonderful companion animals. Their endurance and speed are legendary, which makes them an excellent choice for everything from trail riding to racing. This breed can work cattle as well as perform dressage. Arabian horses are popular mounts for both English and Western pleasure. They are frequently selected for instructional programs and therapeutic riding. Arabian horses have spent thousands of years in the company of humans. We are captivated by their beauty, their devotion, and their proud spirit. The Arabian horse, an ancient servant in war and conquest, is today a strong, intelligent equine partner in both work and play. became involved with Arabian horses back when I was 12 years old. Uh, my parents finally decided I wasn't going to outgrow this horse fixation and let me start taking riding lessons. And I started helping her on the farm and helping her with some of her shows and with the mares, um, the stallion, and it just kept growing from there. And then I've had the chance now as an adult to get some Arabians of my own and have a husband that's wonderful to support me and just keeps going.
And you know, I'm one of the few people I feel like that really is living the dream they had as a child. We have been breeding Arabian horses for 14 years. We started um, with our first black stallion named Astrosgard. Then we have a Kimosabi son named Nakaya. And then we have a new horse that we've only had about a year named Domino um, that's a crabbit Arabian. And then along the way we've gotten various mares and have our babies around and we just have a blast here. I feel Arabians are great horses for young people. Um, like I said, they like to have and be around people. They enjoy being brushed on and petted and played with. Uh, you know, the kids around here will just get all kinds of stuff in their hair and dress them all up, however they want to do them, and have the fun with them. And you can tell they enjoy doing it. I think an Arabian is set apart from other breeds by the fact that they are very friendly. They are extremely people-oriented. They've been around people probably longer than any other breed. Um, they're very versatile also. We can go to a show and if somebody in the family wants to do Western Pleasure, we can do that. I want to do dressage, I can do dressage. My daughter wants to do Hunter Jumper, we can do that. There's uh, costume classes, side saddle, the halter classes, you know, a variety of classes to suit anybody in the family. So you can make it a family fun. I feel Arabians are wonderful horses for first-time horse owners. I do think people need to take into consideration the personality of the horse and the personality of the rider. Um, you can have a wonderful horse or a wonderful rider and not have the right personality match and you'll never get the companionship and the friendship that most people are looking for with their horses. Um, children for the same thing. You need to get a horse that's going to work with your child. Sometimes that may be an older horse that's had a lot of mileage on it and knows what they're doing and they can teach the child. Some children can deal with a horse that doesn't know as much. Same thing goes for adults. It just totally depends on the situation and the person and the personalities involved. Jerry Jones is the owner operator of the Circle K Horse Pavilion in Cookville, Tennessee. After studying behavioral psychology at the University of Houston, he began a 22 year study of equine behavior. For the past eight years, Jerry has taught clinics and seminars to assist students in developing a solid foundation for continuing equine education. We asked Jerry how an inexperienced first-time horse buyer should go about finding the right horse. As an educator, the first thing that, that really comes to my mind is how much they know about horses. Say you had $1,500 to spend on a horse, or $2,500 and uh, knowing that that first price is probably the the cheapest price because you're gonna have to keep that horse up. The first thing I'd tell you if you were a novice, I'd ask you about your motivation. What do you want a horse for? What do you want that horse to do? The next thing I'd say is take $2,500 and spend it on education. Go someplace where somebody's raising horses. Go someplace where somebody's training horses. Fall in there if you have to clean out stalls and stay with that character for a while and then see if you can answer the questions that you've had and, and then get with somebody like that about buying a horse. Because most of the, the horse situation is, is based on emotions of some kind where we have a desire, but we don't reach out and try to figure out why we've got that desire and how that desire applies to you and the horse both. If you take out as a novice according to the statistics and buy a horse, the probability of you keeping that horse is less than 25%. So it's a big turnover in this field. So get the education. If you have to go to clinics and seminars, we still do that all the time. Every time something comes up we can afford, we can travel to, we go to those clinics, those seminars. Education is the key. And what, the more you know about the horse, the more you know about the horse industry, the more interesting your horse is going to be to you. Parasite infestation can cause health problems for your horse up to and including death. Your horse could be severely infested and show absolutely no symptoms. Dr. Johnson discussed the importance of routine parasite control. Dr. Cindy, I'm a little concerned about internal parasites in my horse. What would I look for to determine if my horse maybe had them? Some of the most common signs that you'll see in a horse that has internal parasites are general unthriftiness. They'll lose weight. They won't shed their hair coats properly. Sometimes they'll be sluggish, a little more than usual. Right. Occasionally they'll go off feed. Oh they'll lose their appetite. 
You know, now that you mention that, I, I feel like I've, I've seen some of those things in my horse, and that's kind of what concerned me. Um, I've been in the, the, the feed stores and the place where you can, you can get uh, parasite control, but I don't have any idea w what to use on my horse. Well, the best way to determine what to use is to take a stool sample to your veterinarian. Let them assess what types of parasites that you do have, oh, and then I that see. way they can decide what type of a parasiticide that you need to use. Dr. Johnson, how will a vet determine what kind of parasites my horse has? He'll take that stool sample that you brought and do either a fecal flotation or a fecal smear. And what we're trying to detect on that are the ova or the eggs that are shed by the adult internal parasites that your horse has. By that, we can tell what type of a burden, parasite burden that your horse has, whether it be a light burden or a heavy burden, as well as what types of parasites are in there. What type of products do you use uh, once you've determined the, the, the parasite that needs to be eradicated? Well, I don't work for the pharmaceutical companies, of course, but some of the more common things that I use are these products right here. And these products afford me a great range of treatment options in any type of parasitism that I find. Uh, this type is a paste wormer. This is a paste wormer. This is a liquid wormer. All these medications are oral worming medications, and we can give them by mouth. So that gives us a little bit of ease of dosing as well. Years ago, we used to have to do what was called tubing the horses, where we would pass a nasogastric tube down the nostril and into the stomach, and then we would put the medication directly into the stomach. But now we have much better options than that, and so we don't have to do that as frequently. Occasionally we do, but not as frequently as you used to. But some of the ones that I use are these products right here, just like I said. Uh, it depends on the spectrum that I need to kill. If we have a very large spectrum, a very heavy burden, most of the time I'll fall back on this product because it gets a large amount of worms and it does a very quick job. I'll also use that in foals occasionally. This is called Equilon and it's a form of ivermectin. Now, ivermectin is made by many different pharmaceutical companies, so it just depends on which one you want to deal with as far as which one you buy. There are also some generics. This is a generic solution, and it's cheaper. It costs a little less to use that than the name brand products. Uh, this product affords us a little bit less dosing schedule. You can uh, wait a little longer in between your dosings. Most of the time we recommend dosing about every three months with an internal parasiticide. Some of them we can wait about every six months. And so that helps. That helps if you don't have to do that as frequently. This one helps if we don't have too much of a burden and it will get a very broad spectrum of, of different types of worms. I'll use that in foals sometimes as well. Well, I guess my next step is to get a stool sample into you. Yeah, that would be the best thing to do. And then that way we could evaluate what's going on with your horse. You know, worming for internal parasites in a horse can be a very complicated process. So the best thing to do is just ask your veterinarian for help. That's what they're there for. Excellent. Did you know the Arabian's larger lung and heart enable them to have more endurance than any other breed? Kayla Mills and Jennifer Thomason share a love of horses in particular, Arabian horses. We spent some time with these young equestrians in both the practice and show ring. Um, I've been riding most of my life, and that's practically 12 years. I'm 12 years old, also I've been riding for five years. My mom had horses, so I liked the horses, and I decided I wanted to ride. Um, I went riding once on a trail and I decided I liked it, so I started it. I spend about two, three hours with my horse each day. I groom them, I ride them for about an hour, and I bathe them afterwards. Stay with me. that much problem getting my schoolwork done when I ride with my horses. Just if I have a lot, I just don't ride. If I have a lot of homework, I just don't ride either. Um, I try to spend a lot of time with my horse though, because it helps me get ready for shows. I 
I like showing because it's fun and it gets like competing against other people so that you know if your horse needs more training or doesn't need to just stay with or and move up. I enjoy showing because it's a way to show that I love my horse and I know that, um, show everyone that how much I've worked with my horse. I spend a lot of time with horses because they're really fun to be around and they somewhat, like, if I'm sad or anything, they cheer me up. They always try to help me feel better and sometimes they don't tell you secrets. They keep on to themselves. I enjoy spending time with horses because they're, they're so sweet and nice and they're fun to ride and show. Margaret Martin has spent a large part of her life helping others understand and enjoy their horses. She teaches adults and young people the art of riding at the Circle K Horse Pavilion in Cookville, Tennessee. For Margaret, this has truly become a labor of love. I've been actively involved here for 14 years. Um, I do instruction for children and adults. I do um, the guides on the trail rides. I do training with other horses that, that come in and basically try to maintain the run of the place as well. If it's something that I can take care of other than a vet, I do a lot of my own uh, maintenance as far as that goes, shots, warming, uh, cuts and things that I can take care of. Anything that's not very serious, I do that. Um, and. Yes, in general, taking care of the, the young horses that aren't ready to be ridden or in training or anything like that. So. Children are more open to the horses. Their fear, it's not as great. I think adults are a little more reserved on the fact of they know what pain is, they know what uh, being out of work is, things like that. So they have more of a, a reserve uh, than the child. The child will come in with some fear and you can usually push them um, into a comfort zone with the horse and make their riding excel a little quicker than an adult. Should every inexperienced um, horse rider, do you feel like it's, it's necessary for them to take riding lessons? It should be a must. It should be a must. It's like with anything that you do, um, if you're going to take on any kind of uh, marathon running, biking or anything, any kind of training, you're going to get yourself coached, you want some kind of professional coaching in that, your child the same if they're on a sports team or a swim team or anything like that, they have a coach. Horseback riding seems to be the one that lacks the most on, you know, needing that coaching. Just put the child on, let them ride and there's nothing to it. Definitely a coach. Can you give an ideal or an estimate of how long that a person needs to take riding lessons before they they are at a point where where they're 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 safe on their horse it varies always with the individual of their fear level their natural abilities and things like that um, generally i always say it's as far as you want to go if you want to learn it for just a recreation we have people come in who's going to take a vacation out west or whatever and you know we'll give them two or three months to give them just the basics um, but if you're serious about it, it's, it's as far as you want to take it. If you go into showing, you know, I've got children that's been here since they were five years old and now 17, 18 years old, so, and they're still in the classes. Where do you feel that, that, that people have the biggest problem when they first, whether it be a child or whether it be adult, when they first start taking riding lessons? The thought process that there's not a lot to it, just get on, pull them left. If you want to go left, right for right, kick them to go, pull back to, to stop. It's, it's so complicated. You can go into such great detail. And the longer that you stay in the lessons, the more that you find that out. And that's something I always tell my students. You know, If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. But they find out when they get in there, this is really hard. It's a lot of work. And it takes a lot of discipline to do that. 
Well, I have a, a strong feeling of, um, as a child, this is a strong confidence builder. It, it can just boost a child so much. You know, you, one of my main concerns is being that role model because I hear that all the time. She talks, you know, yesterday a parent said, you know, she even sounds like you when she's at home and talking. So it's, it's, a, it's really self-fulfilling for a child. And there's a lot um, that it can do for an adult's um, self-confidence as well. But it's, it's, it, it really makes me look at myself a lot stronger and try to be a, a nicer person on a personal basis, not just in this professional type thing. But it's, I love the, the interaction of the child and the horse. I think there's nothing greater. Many of today's horse owners have limited time to spend with their horses, whether training or riding. John Lyon shared some of his thoughts on how a horse owner can make the very most of the time that they do spend with their horse. Okay, most of us do have a very limited amount of time, you know, and we'd all like more time, including me. I'd like more time to, to play and work with my horses as well, but, but you're right. We all have a very limited amount of time, and, and how we can best utilize that time is important. And are there better ways to, to utilize it? Yes, most definitely. What we want to do to utilize our time better is to visualize that whatever we're doing, it's for the end result that we want to do with the horse. In other words, if I want to ride my horse down the trail, if that's my goal that next week I want to ride my horse down the trail, what am I doing today, you know, in an exercise that's going to help me down that trail? In other words, I know I'm going to pick up the rein and ask the horse to slow down, so whatever exercise, whatever time I, I have today, then I want to be picking up the rein and asking the horse to slow down or asking the horse to speed up or uh, if I'm going to be on the horse's back, you know, riding the horse, you know, then I want to visualize even though I'm on the ground, I'm actually picking up the rein or the lead rope like I'm on his back, you know, and even though I'm in my arena at home, I don't visualize I'm on in the arena at home on the ground. I visualize that I'm on the horse's back in the middle of the trail ride. And how do I want this horse to respond when I touch that rein? So one of the best ways to get better utilization of our time is to figure out what it is we're doing, what it is we want to do with the horse. And then everything that we do have it relate to what we're doing. For an example, if let's say that in a week I'm going to be riding the horse down the trail, but I put the horse on a lunge line and all he does is lope around and lope around and lope around and lope around and lope around in circles, I'm really not teaching him what it is I want him to do on the trail. So I might be better off just putting a bridle on the horse. I only have 15, 20 minutes, but putting a bridle on the horse and working him on the ground, say, go forward, now stop, now back up, now go forward, now move diagonally or, you know, speed up a little bit, slow down a little bit. So I might be better off doing that, much better off, for 15 or 20 minutes than I would be lunging the horse for two hours. Did you know the first president of the United States of America, George Washington, rode an Arabian? The spirit of a princess, the courage of a prince, and the magic of Walter Farley's Black Stallion. The Arabian Nights Dinner Theater in Orlando, Florida offers a one-of-a-kind equestrian experience that will captivate your imagination and win your heart. The combination of mystery, music, and some of the most beautiful horses in the world will transport you back in time to a place shrouded in romance and mystery. The sensation of participating in a fairy tale pulls you into the arena. As the mist begins to clear, you glimpse movement in the shadows. The music keeps time with your heartbeat as you anticipate the arrival. Suddenly, he appears, the Black Stallion. The fairy tale begins. A beautiful princess awaits her prince, accompanied by a friend and protector a legendary black stallion. Step back in time every night of the year with the cast, 
crew, and of course, the magnificent horses. More than 60 horses participate in this unique theater experience that rivals a Broadway production. As the story unfolds, the audience experiences the mystery of an ancient storybook tale, as well as the excitement of an equestrian performance. Horses and participants interact and perform together in a large indoor theater. As with any theater experience, the lighting, costumes, and music transform the stage into a world apart. The focus of this production is the most famous horse in literature. Walter Farley immortalized the Black Stallion in numerous books that continue to delight young horse lovers all over the world. The story is as old as the desert. Beauty, love, a villain, and of course, heroes, both human and horses. We think you will agree that one of the highlights of this evening occurs in the final moments of the presentation when the arena is filled with the sight and sound of horses. The equine performers of the evening take their final bow. Spectacular. The Arabian Nights Dinner Theater will take you on a romantic adventure. You will never forget the story or the pageantry of an evening in the company of the Black Stallion. An old Arab proverb states, my treasures do not clink together or glitter. They gleam in the sun and neigh in the night. We hope your treasures live and move, laugh and neigh. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As always, when you are horsing around, be safe. I spend about two, three hours in the horse each day. I groom them, I ride them for about an hour, and I bathe them afterwards. Say with me. <laughs> <laughs> I do the same thing she does. <laughs>